Hey, Donna. Am I in the right place? Good morning, everyone. Yes, you are, Mike. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> or at least, at least you're here with all of us. Yeah. <laughs> I got, I got three lanes, so I didn't know which one. Make sure I get the right one here. Oh, you're in the right spot for now. Mike, you can uh, you ready to do your explanation of what the SCCIC is? I'll do my best. Thank you. It's always quite good. Twenty-five words or less. <laughs> well, now you're, now I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Ready? Looks like there is a quorum. Yeah. Just. Okay. Yeah, I was just looking at the other attendee list to see if anybody was in the wrong room. But it looks like we're all um, all in the right place. Okay. Can we call this meeting to order? Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District Board of Directors meeting on March 25th, 2022. Um, may we have a roll call, Donna, please? Okay. Director Downing? You're muted. Director Downing? Here. Thank you. Director Dutra? I don't see Jimmy. Okay. Uh, Director Colin Terry Johnson? Present. Uh, Director Koenig? Here. Director Lynn? Here. Director McPherson? Here. Director Myers? Uh, Director Pagler? Here. Director Parker? Here. Director Peterson? Present. Director Rockin? Here. And ex officio Director Henderson will be, uh, will not be able to attend today. And ex officio Director Northcutt? Not here. Okay. Uh, we do have quorum. All right. Thank you very much. Our next item is to recess to the SCCIC meeting, and uh, <coughs> Director Rotkin is often has a, a, a concise explanation of what that meeting entails. Mike, would you care to explain? Okay, uh, we in this uh, history of this agency in the early '80s, we floated a bond, um, and in order to do so under FCC regulations and banking regulations. We're required not to take the money directly that uh, comes in from the sale of the bonds, but to have it pass through a, uh, another entity. Uh, the rules are that that entity cannot be exactly the same as the board of directors, but can include a portion of the board of directors. And so we created that agency. It took uh, some expense and time to create it. So when we were done with the bond issue, we rather than just killing that little civic uh, association that we had created, we kept it alive. And it has, uh, as you'll see, your, the momentous sum of something like $275 or something in the bank account, just enough to keep it, you know, uh, legally uh, enacted. And um, it, its uh, only function is a pass-through function. It doesn't have any other function. You get the money, you have to keep an account of how much came in, how much went out. Uh, usually it only requires one meeting for that to happen. Um, I will tell the people that are serving, I'm not serving on that now, and the people that are serving on it from the board, we got the uh, sumptuous meal of a sandwich and a bag of potato chips at the time for our meeting. So you should you should stand up for your rights when you when you come to your meeting. Um, but that's basically what the function is. It's it's um, because we're now about to float, uh, uh, we've already agreed and uh, supported the idea of uh, floating a bond to uh, 
to help support our operations and to bring down our costs significantly, actually. Um, you, the, the, uh, that organization's being re, uh, reinvigorated and you'll have a meeting, the staff will you know, inform you about it and so forth. As I said, I think you, know, you should ask for a, for a sandwich lunch at the minimum um, uh, when, you're, when you meet. That's, that's how it works. Very good. Thank you, Mike. And with that, I would turn this over to the president of this group, Bruce McPherson. And you may run this meeting, sir. Okay. Um, I don't think that there's, uh, we'll just call the minutes. I don't have the agenda on that. As a matter of fact, I didn't get it. So I think it's just to approve the minutes of the, the past meeting. And then, um, so I could entertain a motion there. You no, know, your first item actually is, I can tell you, Bruce, is to consider appointing directors Myers and Parker to serve oh, as the, the SCCIC board of directors. And so that you could do that with a motion and second in action. Um, I would make a motion to that effect. Thank you. Second. Okay, so first by Director Kegler and a second by Director Koenig. Correct. All right. uh, and then we'll do a roll. Uh, Director McPherson. Aye. Uh, Director Parker. She won't be voting on this until she's actually appointed. Yeah, oh, I was going to say, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not quite here yet. <laughs> <laughs> We're voting on her voting. Director Koenig. Aye. And uh, Director Hagler. Aye. All right. And the motion passes. Now you should do a roll call of your new, of your new board. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Director McPherson. Here. Director Parker. Here. Director Koenig. Here. And Director Myers, I don't see that she joined us yet. And Director Pegler. Here. Donna, oh, sorry, Donna, this is Shepra. Um, I just got a note from Director Myers. She's finishing up a work meeting and should, should, should be here shortly. Okay, great. Thank you. We have sufficient votes, though, to carry that, right? Yes. Yeah. So next, uh, Bruce, you should ask for oral and written communications. Yes. Uh, are there any? <laughs> thanks, Mike. Are there any oral communications that came to the SCC IC? Uh, there are no written communications. Okay. Are there any anybody from the public would like to um, make a statement? I see one hand from Lonnie Faulkner. Is it to this item? Oh, I apologize. Is this just a regular public statement? No, uh, this, <laughs> no, 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 no this, you'll get to that. That's coming up in a moment. My apologies. I just hopped on. Thank that's you. It's okay. It's okay. A little early. We'll come back to this one. Director McPherson, I have the agenda up too, if you'd like uh, some support yeah. on that, now that I'm official. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll let you take over and tell them what the next item is then. Uh, okay, so uh, we just finished with oral written communications. Do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda? And there are none. There are none. Okay, so we're uh, approving prior year minutes of March 26, 2021. It's in your attachment B of that. I'd move approval. Second. Okay, we have a motion and uh, a second. I'm sorry, who was the second? McPherson. Bruce. Oh, okay. Thank Bruce you. Wants. All right, and uh, a roll on that. Director McPherson? Aye. Director Parker? Uh, aye. Director Koenig? Aye. And Director Pegler? Aye. And the motion passes. Super. Uh, our next uh, agenda item is acceptance of the financial statements for um, year 21. Uh, that would be on attachment C. And I don't know if anybody could bring that up for those people who do not have. Um, this is what Mike would. No. No, it's mentioned. in the agenda. Okay, it's in the agenda. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so you have operating reviews. I'll tell you, your total operating expenses were 250 bucks. Yeah. Dude, I was just going to be so exciting <laughs> as to tell them the oh, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's <I'm> fine. Moving, <laughs> I would move, move acceptance of the item. Second. McPherson. And that was okay, Bruce. Again. Okay. All right. And a roll would be Director McPherson. Aye. Director Parker. Aye. Director Koenig. Aye. And Director Pegler. Aye. And the motion passes. All right. 
So, um, uh, Bruce, I'm going to leave it to you to adjourn. Okay, I uh, I move that we adjourn the uh, the meeting of the SCCIC. Very right. good. Thank and you. with that, we're going to reconvene the board of directors meeting. <clears throat> Uh, the announcements I have today are noting that the meeting is being broadcast by the Community Television of Santa Cruz County. I'm looking to the Board of Directors if they have any comments in general for today's meeting. Not seeing any hands. Let's move into oral and written communications to the board. I know we've received a number of items uh, from staff Donna, is there anything else that has arrived? There were numerous things at the end of the day yesterday, I believe, and uh, you reported on the number of, of uh, letters that you had received. Uh, was over 100, I believe. Correct. Thank you. Um, to the public. Can I go to the public for any comment? Now I see some hands, and uh, the first is James Sandoval. James, would you like to speak, please? Yes, hi, thank you, Larry. Um, James Sandoval here, general chairperson for SMART, who represents the drivers here at Metro. Um, it, this is section seven on the agenda, correct? Uh, that's correct. Okay, I just wanted to speak on the, um, the written communication from um, someone from the public asking for support on SB 942 for free fares or reduced fares for public transportation. Um, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, um, on that subject alone, we just, I, I love the idea in theory, but we piloted for six months, I think it was, um, where we had free fares um, and we created a lot of problems. There was a lot of issues. Um, we had a lot of, a number of, un, you know, not so regular riders jumping on our buses, um, especially our Highway 17s with free Wi-Fi and comfortable seats. And it was really hard to regulate and it was at a point where you know, our regular riders were actually asking for us to go back to charging the fare uh, to get some, rid of some of these non-regular riders. So uh, this is something that I, I wanted to point out because it's, you know, such a great idea in theory, but we just don't want to create another problem by solving one, right? So I just wanted to make sure that we understood that part when uh, considering that. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, looking next, I see Lonnie Faulkner. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to mention that because uh, I had a chance to watch the last board meeting um, to remind folks that um, with funding that might be available, for example, the state rail funding, um, that this brings wonderful potential opportunities to bus metro because a lot of the funding that is available for rail is also available for buses that access the rail. And um, if you look back at the studies, the Unified Corridor Study and the TCAA studies, these studies have shown that actually bringing um, robust transit through rail would actually improve our ridership and offer more um, ridership and funds for our bus metro, which is of course very, very important, especially to South County. And um, just having heard the last speaker, uh, I believe that was Bill 1919. I just want to say that from a standpoint of improving our uh, ability to get more kids on board and set a habit of getting kids riding public transit at an early age, um, Bill 1919 would be such a wonderful um, way to establish bus ridership for youth and then as well, we know that a lack of public transportation, a lack of transportation is a number one barrier to both getting these kids to school on time. Um, communities that have implemented similar projects on a local scale have shown that it more than pays off for itself because it decreases truancy, it keeps kids off the streets, it lowers crime the longevity, the long-term um, positive implications of a bill like 1919 are really positive. And um, so I would offer to do more research on that and take a look at some of the benefits because uh, the benefits are longstanding. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Lonnie. Um, just to clarify, I think the previous speaker had been referring to Bill SB 942. I know there are several transit key measures afoot, but uh, just to clarify. Any other comments from the public? Let me, the, the last speaker was referring to a bill that actually would have the state fund free rides for uh, young people, which is very different than what had been proposed a year earlier, which was that we would bear the cost, which we don't have the money to do. So that, that bill at least is, is it's currently still marked up, looks very promising and we're, our legislative uh, um, lobbyists are, are looking at, you know, keeping track on it to let us know how it's going. Very good. Thank you, Mike. Any other comment from the board? All right. Moving on, we're going to the labor organization communications. I know we've received some written materials. Um, I'm looking to see uh, hands. Let's see, I see Jordan. Jordan Vestmas, would you like to speak, please? Hi, good morning, board. Uh, today's a very important day and uh, I'm excited to um, enter this new era of Metro um, I'm looking really forward to meeting the next CEO. I feel very confident that our uh, extension proposal, our contract extension proposal is very reasonable. And I have confidence that if it was accepted that it would uh, pass very easily when taken to a vote of our members. Um, I'm also very excited for our state Senate bill, SB uh, 957. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much detail there. Well, we can go into that later. Um, I think that that bill will help us achieve labor peace and harmony. And I'm going to be doing my best to forge a, a positive relationship with all these things considered. And, uh, you know, James and I are gonna be doing our best to make everything positive around here. So that's it for now. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, James Sandoval. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I mean, you guys all got our email as to the context as to why we proposed what we did. I mean, um, it just came down to things that happened around us when we were going back and forth over contract extension negotiations. Um, and, and then just going over the history of um, what happened from 2014 to 2018, where, you know, Metro was in a structural deficit and Metro came to our, you know, unions to ask for help. And we, we you know, actually froze our wages for five years, you know, and so, um, and we haven't really seen what we would have had come back yet. And so that's why there's that feeling of, you know, we're just hoping that, you know, at least to get back what we would have had. Um, but not only that, when I was referring to earlier with things happening around to us is that we had BTA, um, you know, just, just give a great deal to their transit workers where they um, offered a 10% over three years and um, also a $3,500 check. And in, and in the article I provided you for you all, and it says this, despite you know deficit or structural deficit concerns, um, they still took care of their workers. And uh, we also have Sam Trans that gave their workers 11% over the next three years and a $3,500 check. And um, Sam Tran, I mean, Golden Gate just ratified a strong contract from my understanding, but I don't know the details of it just yet, but things are happening around us where, you know, transit agencies are really making the moves to make their transit workers feel appreciated for doing what we've been asked to do um, and to build the morale up, you know, because of how much stress and how much, you know, we've been through um, and, and, not only that, but we're all having a difficulty recruiting and retaining people right now, not only just Metro, but I'm sure other transit agencies too, but we need to do things to start making ourselves competitive because right now we are losing people a lot faster than we're bringing them in. I mean, just this week alone, we've lost four more drivers. Our last class was only three and we are looking to hire 12 more drivers with this upcoming class and um, we're only interviewing 11 people. And, you know, not all 11 people more than likely will make it, let alone, you know, not everybody will make it through probation. So we might be looking at another class of three people and that's offering $4,000. So something needs to happen, whether that's, um, you know, being more competitive or boosting the morale for the drivers to where we start, you know, really feeling good about this job and, you know, start recruiting some of the people that we think would be a great fit for this job. I don't know, but something needs to happen. And, um, 
And we just also, I just wanted to emphasize, we also really wanted to get an extension because what we find valuable is the relationship between, you know, the CEO, the next person and our unions. I mean, we saw what happens when we don't get along and we find, you know, uh, uh, contract negotiations to be very rough and to start off with somebody like that. I just don't think it's a great idea, especially with how, you know, burned out everybody is. The last thing we need is contentious, bumpy, you know, the bumpy road of negotiations with somebody new. I'd rather start off fresh um, and, and work on that relationship so we could start focusing our energy together in the right direction and, and move forward. So I really hope you consider an extension and um, and to emphasize on the process, what are you, whatever you guys come up with, it's not up to the union officers. We have to bring it back to our membership and they have to decide by taking a vote on whatever you guys propose. And let's just give them something that's gonna pass, please. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, James. Any other speakers from the public on this? It's from labor groups, actually. Uh, labor groups, excuse me. Thank you, Mike. I do not see any more hands. I believe we can go on to the next item, number nine, which is written communications from the Metro Advisory Committee. And there Donna, are none. We didn't have any, thank you. No. Uh, additional documentation to support existing agenda items. I think you've distributed what materials there might be. Yeah. All right. There's nothing else. All right. And we're about to go to closed session. Julie, I believe I asked the public if there are comments related Correct. to closed session. Correct. All right. So public comment on the items we're addressing in closed session. Might there be any? Give it a moment. I see There's James Sandoval. Go ahead, James. I think I captured for the most part what I wanted to say before closed session, but I just, um, I'm really, really excited and um, looking forward to seeing who um, you guys chose as our next leader for Metro. And I'm just hoping we could arrange something soon where we could start establishing that relationship. But um, I just want everybody here to know uh, the board of directors, including this next person, you have my word we're going to do everything we can to make this work. And um, I'm just, I just want to emphasize we're really, really excited. So thank you so much. Thank you, James. Uh, any other comment? Jordan, go ahead, please. Hi there. I just wanted to second exactly what James said. Um, I'm really looking forward to this. I look forward to meeting this next new person. And I also will be doing everything in my part to make sure we have a very positive, harmonious relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. And checking for any other hands. I think with that, we're ready to go to closed session. And I just want to check that all the directors have received the closed session link. One came this morning. All right. And we will see you over there. Consent agenda. And if, if I could interrupt, Director Fedler, uh, I just want to do a quick report out from the closed sessions. Thank you. The first closed session, the board has determined to appoint a new CEO. And as soon as we do the consent calendar, the very first item will be a lengthy report on that appointment. The second closed session, there is no reportable action. Thank you, Julie. All right. So again, our first item is the consent agenda. Are there any comments from directors? Uh, Manu? Yeah, thank you, Chair Pegler. Um, I just wanted to point out this, um, this plan to acquire um, you know, more zero emissions buses is pretty extensive. Um, uh, not to mention expensive over the years. Um, I, I guess I had a couple of questions on it. One, it seems like we're only acquiring a few electric buses and, and really in the short term and moving towards all hydrogen in the long term. Um, you know, this is just from an infrastructure perspective of trying to continue to support those, uh, the, the electric charging for the buses versus, you know, building a hydrogen infrastructure. Um, you know, what's, why even bother acquiring the, the few electric buses in the short term if we're not really going to support them in the long term? 
Is that a, a question for? I guess. I mean, the, I mean, I don't know if it's that was a good question. <laughs> yeah, I think it was. Um, um, so if I can answer, uh, Margo, sure. CEO. Um, so though it does seem that way in the plan, um, as I explained to the committee, the plan is very flexible. It doesn't really commit us to hydrogen buses. It doesn't come, you know, obviously we have to go with um, something. Um, currently we are meeting with CTE to kind of figure that out. It's very expensive, but most bus purchases are made through grants, uh, federal grants with matching funds. Um, so it's not kind of out of pocket, if that makes sense. Um, the committee um, that I formed is looking into what is right for Metro. We know that a hydrogen fuel station is approximately $23 million. Um, you know, it's very, very expensive. Um, we know that we have the bandwidth uh, for six more chargers. Um, so kind of CTE and a group of, of people at um, Santa Cruz is looking at that question. Um, the biggest question also for us is a Southern uh, facility, which will certainly help with, um, you know, either looking at a hydrogen station or the purchase of electric vehicles. Um, so to your point, um, this uh, plan is very flexible, very open, something that we wanted to put together to make sure that we had the ability to contract or expand either to hydrogen or electric. Um, and that's kind of all I can say now and, until we kind of answer that question. And, you know, certainly um, I didn't want to go too big because I knew we had an un, un, you know, incoming CEO, um, certainly wanted their input. Um, and we had to go with something, um, if that makes sense. And some of that was obviously the direction of Alex um, as well. Um, but we understand that the cost is tremendous, anywhere from um, $280 million to three hundred point four hundred. I can't even say the number. It's so large, um, you know, uh, an amount. Um, so, yes, we know it's a big number. Um, yes, the infrastructure number is, is, is large. Um, but we know that going in, and we're going to set a budget and set locations and, and make sure that it works for us, Metro. Okay, great. I mean, as long as there's opportunities to have more substantive discussions in the future, I mean, and this is really just sort of authorizing the submission of a draft report, because um, as you said, there's a lot in here, um, at, you know, close to whatever, about hundreds of millions of dollars of expenditures on various technologies. And um, I mean, I think even the question of if whether we're going to uh, replace 70% of the fleet with new CNG buses over the next six years is something we might want to discuss further too. So um, and I'm, I'm fine with submitting this report today, but um, yeah, we'd love to have a more substantive discussion in the future. Certainly. That's it for me. Thank you. Larry? We lost Larry. Uh, All right, we already have a vice chair either. I'll, I'll just quickly ask her, any other board you. members have concerns there, about the concern? Okay, I'm back. Right. Sorry, my network dropped off for a moment. All right. Um, any other comments on the consent agenda? Uh, I see a hand from the public from James Sandoval. James? Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to speak on um, section 13.8 on the consent agenda of the board considering continuing to have these board meetings over Zoom. Although, you know, I agree that it's very convenient, but um, this maybe it shouldn't be something on the consent agenda, more of something that should be discussed um, and talked about. I mean, it, it it's, it's it is difficult to have you know for a lot of people great internet enough to you know speak up during these meetings and we have connection issues and it's not the same as in person meetings i'm just hoping we're not disadvantaging people from our community by continuing um, meetings over zoom 
but although I, I do understand the, you know, convenience of it, but, and, uh, and the safety, per, you know, precautions, but um, there's something to think about. Thank you. Thank you, James. Any other comments, public or from the directors? We have a motion. Approve approval of a consent agenda. Second. That was Rotkin and the second was McPherson. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, Donna. Okay, uh, Director Downing. Aye. Director Dutra. Aye. Director Colin Perry Johnson. Aye. Director Koenig. Aye. Director Lynn. Aye. Director McPherson. Aye. Director Myers. Aye. Director Pegler. Aye. Director Parker. Uh, yes. Uh, Director Peterson. Aye. And Director Rockin. Aye. And the motion passes unanimously. Very good. With that, we're on to item 14 of the regular agenda. Consideration of appointment of a CEO, general manager, and approval of employment agreement. We have been in closed session, and Julie, I believe I can read this announcement. Am I correct? Yes, and if Donna could screen share the resolution and to inform the public that all of the materials the board is approving are posted on the Metro website on the landing page. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. Yes. Well, part of it, it needs to be scrolled at some point. Yes. So I will I will read and uh, we, we can scroll as needed, but uh, this is the announcement. Uh, following a nationwide search and many hours of work by our recruitment team, the Board of Directors proposes the appointment of Michael Tree as Santa Cruz Metro's new CEO General Manager. Michael joins us with more than 27 years of experience in public transit and city management, and most recently served as the executive director at Livermore Amador Valley Transit Authority, LAVTA, while simultaneously serving as in the same position of executive director for the Tri-Valley San Joaquin Valley Regional Rail Authority. During his tenure at these agencies, Michael focused on increasing connectivity and ease of use for riders by improving route frequency and expanding travel options for commuters and passengers with disabilities. In his career, Michael has been named Transit Manager of the Year by both the California Association of Coordinated Transportation and the California Transit Association. The Board of Directors and I are excited by Michael's extensive expertise and knowledge of public transit, as well as his proven track record in increasing connectivity for the public and we look forward to him expanding our zero emissions bus plan so Metro can continue to reduce our emissions and our impact on the environment. And if you'd like, I will read through this bulleted item that is up now. This contract date is effective today, March 25th. Contract term is five years commencing April 25th of 2022. The job description appears below and I think is available on the web. Termination at will with severance equal to lesser, a lesser of 18 months salary or B salary for the remaining term of the unexpired contract. Oh, Resignation, sorry. oops, I was sorry. reading that too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, at any time within 30 days notice, there's resignation. Base salary effective April 25th up to 21,250 per month. Annual increases after the first year, 5%, if satisfactorily meets board performance evaluation metrics. Deferred compensation of up to 14% of annual salary. Vacation of 23 days per year. Health, welfare, and other leave benefits consistent with management compensation policy. Life insurance term life policy in the amount of 200% of annual salary. And relocation expenses of up to 10,000 for moving costs plus, plus car mileage, up to $5,500 for temporary housing, maximum of four months, and $5,000 toward home purchase in Santa Cruz County. And being moving through the rest of this, we have further resolved that the board approves revisions to the management wage schedule 
to reference the Chief Executive Officer General Manager's salary schedule. Be it further resolved that the board approves the Chief Executive Officer General Manager's salary schedule, which will reflect the compensation terms in the Chief Executive Officer General Manager's employment agreement. And be it further resolved that the board chair is authorized to take any and other actions necessary to give effect to this resolution. And here we are with an action item, I believe. I will move approval of this resolution. I think we'll hear from the public before we vote on it. We have a second. Just a second, second Donna Lynn. Yes. All right. Yes. Looking to the board and the public for comments. I see any. Looking at the attendant list, not seeing any hands. Directors? I'm not seeing anything. Okay. I believe we can proceed you to know, a roll call. Um, Mr. Chair, yes, I just want to say, I want to, uh, I know Mr. Treat's going to address this, but I want to thank Don Crummy, our acting CEO, and the whole administrative team for the work they've done in the interim. It's been fantastic. We've had a great research team too, but thank you, uh, acting CEO uh, Don Crummy, and the whole administrative team of Metro. Agreed. Very true. Really good. And I, I also want to add that the, um, recruitment uh, team that we hired did a really fabulous job for us. I mean, I when we started this process, I was really worried that we might have a very difficult time finding anybody at this point. And they, and as it turns out, they, they did not approach this um, at the level of uh, going out looking for, you know, people who were, you know, send out an advertisement and see who responds. They went ahead to go out and actually find, uh, get people interested in the application. And that's how we were able to find uh, Mr. Tree for this position. and. They did a really wonderful job with us in terms of handling negotiations to set up the final compensation package that Larry just reported on. Um, it, CEOs are expensive. I think everybody has to understand that. Um, they make a lot more than most of us, if not the rest of us uh, do, and that's just the reality of the world that we live in. But I, he, I think he will, uh, he will be well worth the funding that we're going to be putting into this. Um, we are very excited by by his resume and the work that he's done in our interviews with him. Uh, particularly excited by his a positive experience working with employees in his current and previous jobs. Um, that was a big issue for us, and we wanted to make sure that we hired someone who was going to take that issue very seriously. Um, and so I, I feel very um, happy and proud to be part of the process of delivering uh, this information to the public about the person we've chosen for this important position. Thank you, Mike. Any other comment? Go to a roll call vote. Aye. Director Downing. Aye. Director Dutra. Aye. Welcome aboard. Director Colin Terry Johnson. Aye. Director Koenig. Aye. Director Lynn. Aye. Director McPherson. Aye. Director Myers. Aye. Welcome aboard, Michael. Director Pegler. Aye, and welcome, Michael. Director Parker. Aye, and welcome to another newbie. <laughs> <laughs> Director Peterson. Aye. Director Rockin. Aye. And we have the motion passes unanimously. Very good. Do we have and Michael around here? I, I did just text him. He should okay. be trying to sign in to say hello to everybody. We, we can say in the meantime that he'll be starting a month. For, he has to give notice in his current position. He'll be starting a month from today. Um, and uh, in the meantime, again, I also want to join in the comments about Dawn's wonderful job in this transitional yes. period, which is not quite over. She has another month of work as our <laughs> acting CEO. That's right. Thank you, Dawn. Thank you very um, much. Again, I could not do it without all of the Metro staff, um, great support from everybody. Uh, Donna Bauer, you're my hero. Monique Delphin, uh, Margo, Isaac, couldn't do it with any, without any of you. John and his team with the grant stuff, the legislation stuff that I just didn't have. So I, I, I'm only successful because of them. So thank you very much, appreciate it. Very good. And thank well, you for hanging in. I mean, I know you've had some challenging times and you've done an outstanding job. We really, really appreciate you. 
agreed. Michael has, Michael. Michael has joined us. Michael, are you able to, uh, there you are. Okay. Yes. Uh, any words for us? Welcome to the uh, group. Hey, appreciate it. Thank you for bringing me on board. I am uh, super excited to uh, come over to Metro. Um, really appreciate the confidence in the board. Look forward to working really closely with the board. And uh, also James and Jordan, uh, really look forward to establishing a productive partnership. And uh, working closely with uh, our passengers and, and also the employees. Uh, you have a fantastic agency and I'm looking forward to uh, taking the agency into its next chapter. And uh, I really see a lot of potential moving forward, uh, potential for improving quality of life for residents through uh, good connectivity with public transit and uh, taking advantage of uh, opportunity to grow your zero emission fleet, which, uh, which I think is important for the community. So I'll, I'll just wrap up by saying uh, I'm excited and uh, look forward to joining you soon. Great. We look forward to having you here. Welcome to the team. Thanks. All right. I believe I'm on to the next item. Would that be item 15? Discuss the position on SB 957 in response to the Cure and Correct letter. Uh, Don, are you... Uh, presenting on this? I, I am um, with, with some help uh, from our legal counsel. Um, so just to, um, as a reminder, so Senate Bill 957, SB 957 introduced by Senator Laird would place Santa Cruz Metro under the curb just, uh, jurisdiction. As you know, the Smart Union um, circulated a letter um, to Metro board members uh, for signatures outside of a notice public meeting. And the letter was signed by a number of board members, at least some of whom did not intend for the letter to be presented as an official action by Metro Board. Um, that letter was shared with Senator Laird and he accepted that as evidence that the Metro Board supported the legislation. However, the Metro Board had not held a discussion on this matter in, public, in a public setting yet. Um, as, a, um, sorry, as a result of the, the union circulated letter, a union flyer thanking certain board members and the senator for supporting the legislation. Metro received a public comment and a cure and correct letter asserting a Brown uh, a Brown Act violation. Um, the new the our, our new uh, G, uh, sorry our new CEO GM is expected to begin working in April of 2022, and in light of the new CEO coming on board, along with a number of other reasons described herein. Metro staff recommends that the board take a position opposing SB 957 and allow the new GM to get acclimated and engage the Metro bargaining units in order to establish a positive working relationship with the unions before the board determines whether any changes to the context of Metro's labor relations are considered. Metro can support legislation similar to SB 957 at any time, so there is no urgency to make this change now. Um, in accordance with the with the Brown Act, Metro staff also recommends that the board approve the cure and correct response letter as prepared by general counsel. So a little bit of discussion, PERB is a quasi uh, judicial administrative ag agency charged with administering the collective bargaining statutes covering employees and California's public schools, colleges and universities, employees of the state of California and employees of certain California local public agencies. Metro, along with the vast majority of public transit district, is not subject to PERB. Rather, labor disputes are governed by the processes set forth in Metro's enabling legislation and agreed to in the union's MOUs. So at this time, Metro staff does not believe it's necessary to bring Metro under PERB jurisdiction. Some of the reasons are Metro has not had any cases go to court relative to any alleged violation of a collective bargaining um, uh, statutes which are subject to PERB preview for those agencies that are under the jurisdiction of PERB. Grievance disputes relative to the discipline and contract interpretations have either been resolved in the lower level appeal process or in arbitration and those are rare. Becoming subject to PERB would result in significant expense to Metro as any case being filed against Metro in front of PERB would result in attorney, I'm sorry, an additional attorney's fees and a significant dedication of staff time including union staff and other resources. The PERB process, which includes, um, I won't read through all of the steps, but it's basically eight to nine steps um, to, to be able to file something in the PERB and to hear back. And PERB also does not require any threshold to file charges, nor does it require any preliminary discussions between the parties before filing a charge. Currently, Metro and the unions must work out differences 
over the bargaining table, but PERB makes it very easy for parties to instead resort immediately to litigation. The PERB process would also permit Metro to file unfair labor practice against the unions, which would essentially escalate disputes uh, in terms of both time and money for both sides. The language in the Metro's enabling legislation, the Public Utilities Code Section 98000, and the union MO MOUs already provide the unions needed protections, including Metro's obligation to bargain in good faith, not necessarily afforded other entities who are covered by PERB. Um, PERB also continues to experience unpre unprecedented backlogs, sometimes 12 to 18 months. So at this time, Metro staff recommends the board take action by motion to oppose SB 957. Um, in addition, the Brown Act Cure and Correct Letter, the Brown Act prohibits the legislative body meetings outside of properly noticed public meetings. Uh, a Brown Act serial meeting is a series of meetings or communications between individuals in which ideas are exchanged among a majority of legislative body through persons acting as intermediaries. Metro received an anonymous cure and correct letter, which is the first step in challenge in an action under the Brown Act, alleging that the board violated Brown Act in connection with the letter circulated by Smart Union in support of curb legislation, which was signed by several board members. Because the cure and correct letter is anonymous, meaning Metro really has no way to respond to the letter writer as required by the Brown Act, it's very unlikely that the letter would lead to, lit to litigation. Nevertheless, because a cure and correct letter was received, at this time, Metro staff recommends that the board, A, approve the attached letter, which was prepared by general counsel to respond to the anonymous cure and correct letter, and B, place a copy of the letter signed by the board chair in the minutes of this board meeting. Um, I would just like to offer comments my personal comments to um, the act of, of Metro going under PERB um, for the reasons that the unions have, have given. Um, I feel that I do have a very um, open relationship with, with the unions. Um, I, I have never denied a meeting if requested by um, a union leader. Um, I take all phone calls, and if I miss a phone call, 99% of the time I'm shooting a text message saying, hey, I'm in a meeting, I'll call you back, or do you still need me? You know, so I'm always making that connection. Um, I've, we've talked about employee situations uh, on the weekends, at night. I was on the line with one of the unions on Christmas Eve as I was making dinner. So I, I just want to make it known that I, I, I've never had a labor um, violation brought to my attention um, between management and the unions. Um, and I've always worked, even when I didn't technically have to, it wasn't in any writing or in a contract that said I had to do a give. Um, there's many times that I did do a give with meeting with the unions because my philosophy is sometimes you have to give even when you're, when you're, when you don't have to, even when you legally don't have to, because that's what opens up the relationship, the communication, the collaboration. Um, and sometimes they maybe the union will 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 give in a in a in a sense where they don't um, necessarily have to in writing as well. Um, I just I don't think it's necessary to rush this through. I, I do strongly believe that the new CEO deserves to come in and create his um, his bridges with the unions. Um, and I, I feel like it would be. Um, very different than, than the past. And so I feel like we should have a chance to, to go that route before we do this. It, it's going to be a very expensive thing. Um, I, it may not cost a dollar amount to actually file a charge, but I am not an attorney. I cannot go and sit down in a, um, in a hearing, in a PERB hearing and, and act like I am an attorney. So of course we're going to have attorneys there with us and that, that's very expensive. Even if the charge goes nowhere, even if it um, they file the charge and it's it's not really a labor dispute that should go under PERB and, and we receive that letter back saying that, somebody still needs to re reply to that. They need to file the, the, their answer and all of that and, and all of those things cost money. Um, so I, I wanted to share that, that part uh, before you all open discussion. Thank you, Dawn. Uh, I, have a, Julie, I have a procedural question before yes, we- Sure, Mike. Open. I wanted to ask Julie if it's uh, we can divide this question and simply vote on the uh, accepting the cure and correct letter separate from the substantive issue of how we feel about the PERB issue yes. and just just be done with that. I I would 
propose to the chair that he consider that uh, as a sort of procedural matter, because those are in a way a separate issue. And I'd like to quickly dispose of the, you know, we do need to respond to that, legally respond to the cure and correct uh, uh, letter. And I think we should do that quickly. And I, I, don't, I don't think there'll be a dispute about, I assume, I hope there will not be a dispute about that. And then we'll move on to the more substantive question we have to discuss. I appreciate that, Chair Rockton. Uh, do we have a motion to that effect? I'll make that motion. I'll second that. All right, I heard a motion from Rockton, a second from McPherson. And uh, just to repeat, Mike, uh, this is the motion for the cure and correct. Right, this, we've been presented with a cure and correct response. Uh, everybody has a copy of that. It's on the website and so forth. Um, and it was referred to earlier. And I just think we should approve that, send it off and dispose of that matter. And then, as I say, have a more full discussion in the order that people want to speak and so forth. I see multiple hands from directors. Uh, is this in comment to this motion? No. No. Director Koenig? Well, no. My original question was yes, essentially the same uh, as, as what Mike just asked, but does this, um, if we're going to make a motion to take these in separate, uh, as separate items, do we not need to bring that out for public comment first, or would we wait until it now becomes its own item and then take it out for public comment? You, you will need to allow public comment you have a, a motion and a second. There should be a board discussion, if any, and then allow public comment before you all vote on the cure and correct letter. Very good. Thank you. So questions to this motion from the directors? Is this for the cure and correct motion or is this to separate yes, them? Yes, this is for the cure and correct motion. I'm sorry to clarify. I thought this was the motion to separate the cure and correct from the. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. The chair has the, the chair has the authority to make that uh, the separation according oh, to our attorney, and so this is actually substantive, and not about the issue about how we feel about her, but whether we should uh, uh, approve this cure and correct letter to be in, into our minutes. Got it. Thank you. Is that clear? All right. Uh, any comments? Thank you, Chair. I appreciate you, uh, Chair Pegler, for. Uh, for clarifying. All right. Uh, any comments from the public? Not seeing any. And if already checked, no other comment from the directors. I believe we can vote on this motion on the cure and correct letter. Okay. Uh, director, I actually, uh, director, I actually had a question. Please. I actually please. had a question first. Um, because this was an anonymous letter and one of the things that it mentioned was this action taken on February 25th by members of this board. I don't believe that actually happened on the 25th. So I'm trying to understand why, you know, why this letter is being um, written to someone who's, we don't even know who that is. I'm just trying to understand better why we would do this. Julie, you can help me. With it. Yes, uh, it, it's a good question. And what I can say is that I'm doing it to be exercising the utmost caution to protect mm -hmm. the agency. You could take the position that, hey, we don't think a Brown Act violation occurred and we're not going to cure and correct. We're not going to respond. That That is an option. I don't recommend it because I don't think you're losing anything. You're not admitting any Brown Act violation occurred. Mm -hmm. And the letter says that. And, and I'm not saying a Brown Act violation occurred. However, if someone does challenge anything that has happened in the past, legally, this letter takes care of that. So I don't see any harm in doing it. You, you, you absolutely could not do it. Uh, but as your legal counsel, it's the least risky path for Metro to do this letter that admits nothing, <laughs> but complies with the law. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions from the directors? I saw none from the public. Donna, I think we can vote. Okay. Uh, Director Downey. Aye. Director Dutra. Aye. Director Colin Terry Johnson. Aye. Director Koenig. Aye. Director Lynn. 
Aye. Director McPherson. Aye. Director Myers. Aye. Director Pagler. Aye. Director Parker. Aye. Director Peterson. Aye. Director Rockin. Aye. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Chair. Um, the next item I see, well, this is on to Brew Director McPherson. You had your hand up. Yes, um, this is in relation to that Senate Bill 957 um, about regarding curb. And I can't think of a worse time that something like this could come before us with the new, C new CEO coming on board. Uh, especially after the board, there were members that had indicated we should at least wait 90 to 120 days to see if we really do need something like this. Um, I, I really believe in local government is the best government. And what we're doing here is transferring a huge part of our operation to a state agency in San Francisco or Sacramento or wherever. It's gonna cost us thousands of dollars and months and years and time that our staff really doesn't need to have on their plate. Um, I am um, really disappointed that this has come to uh, at this point. I think that um, I heard that some people have said, hey, this gives us some insurance. I think the right term is uh, there's an assurance that this is the bargaining chips of Metro are highly gonna be transferred to a state agency without our own CEO and our administrative team bargaining with the union. I think it comes at a terrible time. I'm, um, it's really disappointing. I'm, uh, I think it's not something we should put on our, um, our, or leave from our incoming CEO. And I think we can handle our situation just fine, thank you. I would rather do it to an unnamed state agency than somewhere else. Um, obviously, I'm very strong in this opinion, and I hope that um, we just back off from supporting SB uh, 957 as, it, as is recommended by our staff. Thank you, Director McPherson. Uh, Director Koenig, you're next. Thank you, Chair Pegler. Um, I would just suggest that we, we table the discussion for now. I mean, the intent of um, you know, the, my motion from the January 25th meeting was to give uh, our new CEO time to, to weigh in on the matter so that, um, you know, we could have a, a substantive discussion with his input. Um, I think it was to delay uh, this item until um, after such time as the new CEO was hired, but within 90 days of that point. So, um, I mean, I suppose effectively we've approved the agreement, but I mean, he's not technically started. Um, so, I mean, I, this sort of, in my mind, trying to dispose of this issue completely uh, at this time is just a little bit premature um, and I would prefer to wait. I, I guess if I, a, a question would be, is there any reason why we would have to um, submit a formal opinion in support or opposition to 957 at this time? I don't know, Julie, are you able to respond to that? Well, I can't really speak for the Senator. Um, I, I know that, and I wasn't part of the discussions with the Senator. So I can only tell you what I've heard from your lobbyist, which is that the Senator has said he would not put forward the legislation without both the board and the unions endorsing it. Um, but but then he went ahead and put it forward because of that letter that was circulated. Um, so I, I guess I don't really know what his position would be now that we've made clear that that wasn't an official action of the board and that the board has not officially endorsed or opposed. Because um, the board, if the board says, if we don't want to take a position on that legislation, you've got legislation that's out there and he may be looking for a position. I, I just don't know. Um, and I don't know if any board members have spoken with the Senator and they could tell you what they know, but I don't know. Thank you, Julie. I'm gonna move through the directors. Uh, Director Koenig, is that appropriate for you? Yeah, that that's fine. I mean, it just it seems to me the soonest we would wanna bring this back to a meeting would be with be May, since our April meeting is actually still before the official start date of our new CEO. 
Right, okay, thank you. Director Peterson. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate uh, Supervisor Koenig's comments, and I think that it's really important for us to consider uh, one, as noted uh, in in the staff report and, and, and as others have brought up as well, that no official action of the board has been taken on this. So the board has not taken a support or opposed position on SB 957 at this time. And while uh, several of us within our legal rights um, expressed our personal support uh, for it, it's unfortunate that it's come to this kind of situation. However, in the staff report, it mentions um, specifically that we would want to wait to allow Metro bargaining units to establish a positive working relationship um, with our new um, CEO amongst the unions so that labor relations are, are um, positive moving forward. And so I think if the idea here is that we want to offer a clean slate for our new CEO to come into, then voting right now to oppose 957 essentially does the same as if we were to vote right now to support 957 in that it puts um, something, some kind of notation out there about whether the board is supporting or opposing, which then gives an idea to the new CEO as to how we feel about this. I think if the idea is that we do want to have some kind of neutral position um, and then either we do as Supervisor Koenig recommends and table this, or if the board feels that it's important that we take some kind of action to out of abundance of caution show that the board has not previously um, taken a vote to support this, that we should take a vote uh, of, of neutrality essentially saying that we are of a neutral position or of no position at this time until the time that our new CEO can come on and then we can take a vote specifically saying whether or not we support or oppose. But I think that if in the staff report we're suggesting that we allow time for the new CEO to um, acclimate, then opposing taking a vote to oppose a bill essentially um, does the same thing as it would to take a vote to, to support it. So I would highly recommend that all of the uh, all of my colleagues consider that we either remain neutral or take no action at this time, um, and and consider it later as as a body. Thank, Thank you. you, Director Peterson. Director Lynn. I did uh, speak with Senator Laird, and he did tell me. I told him the the uh, uh, action that was taken or the position that was taken January twenty eighth. And he said, well, that was contrary to the letter he received, that he acted on moving the legislation forward based on um, receiving documentation that a majority of the board supported CURB. And he said that was the position he would publicly give, is that he based moving this legislation forward on a letter that he believed to be official action. And I, I told him at the time that I did not believe that was the intent. Um, and he said that's not what he'd been told. Um, that, and he pointed to the flyer and said, you know, all these voters are here. I'm moving. He said I'm move, I didn't make a decision to move forward until I received the majority um, of the signatures. So it was taken with that understanding on his part. That's what he he told me. Um, I, I've not been supportive of her based on what I've learned as far as the expense from um, the attorney fees, the, the information I have that it takes at least 12 months and often more than that, 18 months, for any um, complaint to move forward. And, you know, talking to Don and, and others on the staff on how things have been handled and the work that they've done, Don gave an example on, on someone who we are uh, quit rather than retire and lost medical benefits and, and the work she did to help resolve that that would not have been able to be done without per, if it were in PERB. And so knowing and looking at and getting the information I've received as far as one expense, not only to Metro, but even to the unions and their attorneys having to um, handle these issues that would be brought forward. And um, you know, the work, the good work that our staff has done to resolve issues. I just feel like, you know, I, I would at least want to see us wait for through the year and see that things continue. But my concern is that the uh, bill moving forward was based on John Laird, Senator Laird's understanding that there was official action taken. So I'm thankful the Cure and Correct letter was done. And, um, you know, I think at very least, I agree with Mono that 
let's let our CEO get in place and get a chance to, to be able to present a, 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 all the information, a staff report with both sides and hear all the information and hear his input. Thank you, Director Lynn. Director Rothkin. Um, I move to table this item until our, our June meeting. Uh, if it gets a second, it's not debatable except for to when the timing. If somebody wants to pick a different date, that could be debated. But the, it's not. We can, it ends debate if we get seconded. We just have a vote. Do I hear a second? Second. That was from Director Koenig. So. All right, help me here, Mike. We're uh, unless, unless somebody wants to argue, now you, June, June, you can have unless, a unless, unless, yeah. unless no, unless June is the right uh, time to do this. Is this is not a debatable motion? And motion to table is not debatable. It simply gets voted on. That could be discussion. There's discussion nope. now. Yes. No, no, a move to table is not discussed. Read Robert's rules of order. Julie. Except for, the time, except for the time to which you can disagree with June. You think August is better or May or whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm pulling up the rules of procedure right now. Just give me a sec. I know we have at least two directors that were going to speak and two members of the public. Okay, I, I checked the board's rules of procedure and a motion to postpone or table is not debatable and cannot be amended and requires at least six affirmative votes for passage. Mike's right. Okay, uh, Julie, do we postpone public comment on this as well? No, I, I think that that the rules of procedure just have to Recording in progress. Okay, there we go. It just gave there me. There you are. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Chair Pegler. Board members, I'm Louis Costa. I'm the State Legislative Director for Smart Transportation Division. Um, and I am uh, a Smart Transportation Division member, have been for 25 years. So I appreciate the opportunity this morning. I want to I want to try to clarify a couple of things that are, that are misconceptions. First and foremost, um, there is no transferring of board's business to a state agency. Um, that, that, that's just simply not the case of current. Currently, the status quo is that if there is a unfair labor practice charge that is not identified within collective bargaining agreements or the, the governing charter of the transit agency, those are the only cases that go to superior court for adjudication, as was the case in 2020, um, when the union uh, sought relief from the increase in the number of passengers uh, in, in allowed inside of the uh, the buses during the pandemic. Those are the only cases that will go to per those types of cases that are not are already uh, automatically covered under collective bargaining agreements or under the grievance and arbitration procedures um, that are in place today. So the current status of, of how you conduct business remains exactly the same. The unions are still going to come and try to resolve all of their issues that they can for any of the collective bargaining things. Collective bargaining doesn't even fall under the purview of PERB or the jurisdiction of PERB because it's already covered under the CBAs. So there's a misconception that this is going to have some grand uh, state agency overseeing your 
your your board and the and, and Santa Cruz Metro. The, the board retains fully autonomous in how it governs itself. There is no oversight by her. It's there as for the same purpose that the superior court is now. In the event that there is a a unfair labor practice that is not previously covered, that's where the, the relief is. That's where the remedy is for either the board to go to or for the unions to go to. Those are the only cases that would fall under firms purview or the jurisdiction. That's it. I mean, this is if, if, if not every single case. If there's a problem like, like the medical situation that uh, that was discussed, that would have still been handled in-house. That wouldn't have been something that would have gone to PERB because the unions are going to continue to fix everything or try to fix everything locally. That's only in their best interest and the best interest of their members. So there, there's the misconception up to what this is, I think. I mean, it's only a very select number of unfair labor practices that would fall under PERB's jurisdiction. And so far in the past two years, there's only been one that I'm aware of. It's not like the floodgates are going to open up and all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of both sides are, are being good actors. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clarified. Um, and as far as the extra expense that's involved, um, the, the listing of the nine or so items, the first five or six, I believe, are all online. And PERB allows for non-attorneys to represent. In fact, many of the cases in, in PERB, as, as we stated in our in our rebuttal to some of the, the staff's comments that we took exception to, um, they allow non-attorneys and they allow self-representation. So instead of having to hire outside counsel, uh, you can represent yourself at PERB as it can Santa Cruz Metro. Um, they can use in-house counsel. They can use their, their new CEO to make the case through the administrative process until there's a formal hearing. And at that point, if they choose to hire outside counsel, they can do so. So the only thing that changes with this, with this bill, with SB 957, the only essential change for the way things are now, the status quo now, is that the venue for addressing an unfair labor practice that is not already covered by statute or by agreement would change from superior court to PERB. That is the only real change here. So I, I just, I, I think that, that, that it's, there's a misconception as to what exactly this means. The board remains fully autonomous in handling its business. And the only things that would go to PERB are the things that would go, or the cases and the charges that would go now to superior court. Not that what is collectively bargained, not that what is, is uh, grieved and arbitrated under the current procedures, none of that would change. The only things that would go to PERB is what would have eventually ended in Superior Court. So I, I hope you read our answers to the to, to the staff's uh, report and the, and the exceptions that we took, and I hope you take those to heart going forward. And I'm always available to answer any questions if possible to help resolve this issue. We think that SB 5957 would benefit both Metro and its employees, and we would urge that you support this legislation. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you for your comment. I want to reiterate that we're looking at a motion to table this item until June. I don't I believe we can still go to public comment. Jordan, you're the next. Jordan Vescomas. Hi, all. Um, pretty much with this, we're just asking for the same right to PERB that the city has, the county, UCSC, Cabrillo, and countless other public agencies already have. I mean, if you're talking about private sector, Unions, they have access to the NLRB, public sector in almost every regard except for transit have access to PERB. We want the same right that all other, the majority of all other unions have. So I'll just keep it at that. Thank you, Jordan. James, you're next. James Sandoval. Hey, Chair. Um, yeah, I just want to reiterate what uh, Louis Costa said. I mean, we literally have a recourse right now to go to court instead of going through PERB. And with court, you have to hire attorneys. With PERB, you don't have to hire attorneys. You can self-represent. And, you know, the arbitrations that we've handled so far in the last two years, our drivers, me, and our team of drivers have represented ourselves in that. If Metro chooses to hire attorneys, that's on them, on you guys but you have the option to self-represent with PERB, but you're forced to hire attorneys with court. So I could actually argue that it's way more expensive to keep our, our recourse that we have right now. And, um, you know, and, and it sucks to be accused that we're gonna take every single dispute through the formal process. 
but for any of you that know me what really well, you know, I, I do my best to, to handle things at the lowest level as possible. Um, I, I will continue to call, I will continue to email, I will continue to do whatever I can to handle in-house. And say it even gets to the point where we do file a charge against each other. What's to stop from any board member to, you know, from inserting themselves to help the situation from, you know, progressing any further? Uh, it's just, it seems like there's a huge misconception of what this is and that it's brand new. It's been around for a really long time. Many other unions have this type of recourse and can save both the union and Metro a lot of money for having this type of recourse and accountability. That's all it really comes down to is accountability and for our unions to come forward and commit to not committing unfair labor practices because we're not afraid, afraid of accountability. We're just really hoping that Metro is willing to come forward and do the same thing. And, you know, uh, and, and Metro is using public money when it comes down to this stuff. And we're, if we're going to be hiring attorneys to go through litigation every single time, that's public money. And for the union side, it's <laughs> hard-earned money through dues that we're using. And it doesn't benefit us when we're colliding like this, especially spending the money and resources and energy that we could actually use moving forward. And so I just, um, I'm really hoping that you guys got the time to take a, a look at that letter where we um, addressed a lot of the false and misleading and misconceptions of PERP and also the over 130 emails that we, you know, that, that the public sent in in support of SB 957. You know, um, we hate when the public gets caught up in the middle of our disputes, but that can happen. And, and having something like PERP would make sure that each side is always working with each other. I'm not accusing the next person from being going to be a problem at all but you know i just it does not hurt to have something like insurance and it is like insurance to be in place just in case something something were to happen and we don't have to go through court to get it handled and instead go to an expert agency that's designed in public employment relations for free thank you very much thank you last public commenter cesar laura Good morning, board. Uh, Cesar Lara with the Monterey Bay Central Labor Council. In regards to the question, I, um, I'm, uh, um, I'm saying some comments opposing to the motion that was uh, set on the table. I think that the board needs to vote on, on the on, on what's being proposed, and we actually would support against uh, op opposition. Uh, but it's uh, would like for it to be acted on today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, that's the last of that um, comment. Mike, your hand is up. Uh, oh no, sorry, I should have taken it down. Okay, just checking. All right, we're back to the motion. I think we are prepared to vote. Donna? Okay. And this is this just is to delay uh, further discussion until June. That's correct. Delaying action <laughs> until June. It is tabled until June our June okay. meeting. Thank you, Don. Uh, Director Downey. That's the June, that's the June 25th meeting. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And yes. when does Michael Tree start? April, April 25th. 25th. That's two, April. two months. Yeah, as I said, people could argue what's open, what is debatable is whether that June's too early and somebody could argue for August. I'm trying to be reasonable. I thought there was no discussion. I'm just trying to answer the procedural, <laughs> the procedural question, not the substance of it. All right. Oh, Donna, can, okay. You got it? All right. Yeah. Donna, can we proceed with the vote? Okay. Rebecca Downey. Aye. Rebecca Dutra. Or excuse me, Director <laughs> Dutra. <laughs> oh, Jimmy. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, because I had comments to say. Sorry. Uh, Director Commentary Johnson. Aye. Director Koenig. Aye. Director Lind. Aye. Director McPherson. Aye. Director Myers. Aye. Director Pegler. Aye. Director Parker. No. And Director Peterson. Aye. Director Rockin. Aye. And the motion passes. Okay. We, we are now on to the next item, which is a retiree resolution of appreciation. I'm going to 
read a bit of bio about Eleuterio, also Pedro Garcia Simano. Raised his children while working for Metro and is very proud to have two of his sons working for Metro as well. Pedro has always been one of those operators who understood the importance of customer service. He started each day with a great attitude, laughter and smiles. Pedro can even be heard singing as he walks down the hallway when he ends his day. Metro staff have always appreciated his hard work and professionalism, especially on one particular morning when his route in Watsonville came across a toddler walking around in the dark. Pedro was acknowledged for going above and beyond by being aware and stepping into action when he saw the child in danger. He kept the child safe until authorities took over. Pedro has always been a professional, safe operator in his conduct and appearance. He will be remembered as a driver that always wore ties and had time to laugh with his coworkers. Although he will be missed by all, we wish him well as he retires to a ranch home with his wife in the Madeira. Second, uh, second resolution is for Christopher Sands. Chris enjoyed his position as a bus operator and took pride in helping the public by getting them to their destination safely. He always went out of his way to make connections for his passengers. His coworkers and Metro staff and the board wish him well on his retirement. He will spend his time with his wife and son enjoying Santa Cruz. Those are our two retirees of the hand of appreciation possibly. Thank you. Next item. We're you, have a hand, you have a hand up, I think. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Anna Marie, hands up. Hi. Um, Hi. So I just, I have uh, Pedro here and he'd like to share oh, a few great. words with, to the Terrific. board. Thank you. Great. Oh, hi. Hi. Welcome. Oh, thank you. So I want to say thank you for everything that we say, but, um, and I appreciate it. So um, I'm excited right now, you know, because I mean, I have to do something different than I used to do it. But uh, and so I can say, you know, thank you very much. and. Uh, Thank you. So, thank you, Pedro. We really appreciate your years of work. Wish all right. you all the best in retirement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And Very good. All right. Anna, thanks for bringing him on. That's great. All right. Our next item is the CEO oral report. Um, Don, are you ready? I'm ready. There you are. Okay. And I'll try to move as fast as I can. I know we're going pretty late this morning. So yep. um, I've, I've cut a couple of items off that I think you can live without hearing about right now. Um, so just to report, uh, Wandamu Mangstu and Margot Ross attended our legislative conference um, in D.C. earlier this month. And so wanted to report a couple of takeaways from there. Um, they conducted meetings with staff members of Congress of Senator Alex Padilla, um, Rep. Anna Ishu, and Rep. Panetta. Um, they expressed our appreciation uh, to those senators and representatives for the COVID-19 stimulus funding. Um, it helped us offset extraordinary direct costs and revenue losses that we continue to experience as a result of the pandemic and help us avoid layoffs of our critical workforce, um, continue serving and, and also helping continue servers serving writers who rely on Metro to conduct essential business, access uh, vital services and play an indispensable role in region social and economic recovery from COVID-19. And then we also brief them about Metro's immediate capital funding needs, including zero emission bus fleet transition plan. Um, wanted to give a quick update. Uh, Governor Newsom proposes 11, 11 billion relief package for Californians facing higher gas prices. Um, so up to what that is, is up to 600 million to pause a part of the sales tax rate on diesel for one year, 523 million to pause the inflationary adjustment to gas and diesel exercise tax rates, 750 million incentive grants to transit and rail agencies to provide free transit for Californians for three months. The Newsom administrative uh, administration will meet with the legislature to negotiate the details of the proposal in the coming days. 
And once approved through legislature, the, the first payments could begin as soon as, um, as early as July. Now, what does that mean for Metro's funds, STA funded by gas diesel taxes? Um, well, it's funded entirely from the state sales tax on diesel fuel and the STA program account for as much as 3.5 million to 4.4 million, which is 6% of the total budget for Metro. Um, we did receive clarification from CTA that the governor is only proposing to suspend the sales tax on diesel portion that goes to the general fund, not to the STA program. So they don't propose to touch that stream. For the diesel sales tax pause, the intent is to fill back the lost revenue for the general funding, the general fund funding so that it net zero impacts to all programs. The mechanics as to how the general funds would be transferred out would still need to be worked out, but this is the general idea behind it. Um, a, a great thing to report is that Metro successfully completed uh, the FTA fiscal year 21 COVID-19 echo review. So it is a significant accomplishment as Metro provided responses that addressed all identified issues prior to the final report. This will help us have a smooth FTA triennial audit later this year, sometime between October and December. Um, and fiscal year 23 congressionally directed spending request earmarks are now live. So in the coming weeks, staff will submit project requests for the members of Congress representing the Santa Cruz area to advocate for the inclusion of the earmarks for Metro Capital projects. Um, one other thing to report is our very own safety and security risk director, Curtis Moses, was invited to speak at the National SGR Conference in Washington, D.C. His topic covered how a transit agency safe, uh, safety plan how it supports the FTA requirement for maintaining transit assets uh, in the state of good repair. I'm trying to go really fast so that you can all get back to your lives. Um, we do have a new customer service window at the Pacific Station, um, and so it's more visible to the public. It's right where it used to be by the double doors that um, for people to access the public restrooms, but the new window is much larger, more visible, and easier to access. Another thing to note is TSA mask mandate is due to expire on, on April 18th, which uh, will discontinue face masks required on buses and transit hubs, um, unless it gets extended again, but it is due to ex expire on April 18th. Um, one thing I did not want to report to you, and I feel like I jinxed myself, is because uh, up to yesterday, we didn't have any positives since our last, uh, any COVID positives since our last meeting. Um, however, we have had five um, employees test positive over the last two days. Um, they are um, unvaccinated employees. Um, so we're wondering if maybe this new variant uh, is, is, is stronger against non-vaccinated. We're not really sure, but that's, that's the data that we have right now. And then on to end with a pause on a positive note, we'd like to welcome our new hires. Um, we have Maximilian Valera. He is our new payroll specialist who started with us in March. We have Patrick Sepe and Raul Guzman, who are our two new paratransit operators that also started with us this month. And that is all I have, unless you have any questions for me. Hey, Don, any questions? Uh, it's been brought to my attention that I failed to get a, a motion to uh, uh, accept the uh, resolutions of appreciation for my the two retirees. So Mike, oh, I see so a motion. Uh, second, anyone? I'll second. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, probably no need for discussion. If we could vote on that, Donna, then we'll take care of that problem. Okay, great. Thank you. Director Downing. Aye. Director Dutra. Aye. Director Colin Terry Johnson. Aye. Director Koenig. Aye. Director Lynn. Aye. Director McPherson. Aye. Director Myers. Aye. Director Pegler. Aye. Director Parker. Aye. Director Peterson. Aye. Director Rockin. Aye. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. My apologies for skipping that. Uh, on to item 18. Uh, Chuck, we have a uh, fiscal year 23 and 24 preliminary operating budgets and the fiscal year 23 capital budget for review. Okay. Um, if we want to go ahead and pull it up, I'm, I'm going to go pretty quick. So please stop me if we want to stop and, and hang on anything. Uh, we have to do this um, 
because the RT, RTC needs this information, but it needs to be approved by the board. This is very, very preliminary. We're still making adjustments today. And like I said, we'll come back in May with kind of our final numbers, but at least it gives you directionally where we're going. Um, if we want to just hop on to the first slide, I think it's line slide 40. All right, so this is our new operating PL. This aligns more with NTD database as well as other transit agencies. Uh, what we've done is basically taken out all the, I'll just say, non passenger related revenue that we've put up at the top and kind of moved it down to non operating revenue. There's a debate between whether or not passengers go against that revenue and so forth, but it's directly uh, the passenger revenue now is at the top. We have our operating expenses, how we run our business, and then where it says operating surplus, where in this case is a deficit. Um, this is how we're really operating the agency in the sense of our revenues that come in and how we operate going forward. So uh, our FY23 budget right now is about $3.2 million higher in a loss, but that's because we've had inflationary items as well as just stagnant to flat uh, operating passenger revenues. Down below uh, on our non-operating revenues and expenses. So this is like our sales tax, our measure D, state and federal grants and so forth, as well as our pension UAL now going over to the bond payments. And then what I call COVID related costs. These are like one-time costs that are eventually gonna go away, but this is for like supplies as well as people here for testing. Um, ultimately what that gets down to is that we're actually running about 5.8 million, I'm sorry, um, we're running about uh, $7.6 million favorable, at least um, at this point versus our 22 budget. Um, but that still means we're still kind of in the hole. And we're one we're running right now, it's about $1.6 million unfavorable for the year for FY23. We still have to cover that. We got to figure it out. We got to figure out the you know wage increases. We got to figure out whether or not we're going to hold steady with our um, sales tax or whether this inflation and the interest rates going up, if that's going to suppress it. So there's a lot of still external factors we're still looking at. And we have some timing issues. Things come in in April and May that will update with actuals, um, bills, and so forth. So if we want to move on, uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to go through these fairly quickly. So these are the assumptions around just the operating passenger revenues. Uh, primarily, our passenger revenues as a total are only up about 500. That's primarily as our ridership is up. But after we've negotiated our UCSC and our Creo College contracts, we've actually kind of come down. So the net net is about uh, about 43K or about 5% um, above our FY22 uh, budget. And like I said, this is operating revenue. This is our passenger fares. And our contracts with the colleges in, in the city of Santa Cruz. It's 0.5 percent, 0.5 percent, right? 0.5 percent. Yeah, I'm sorry. Did I say 5 percent? I'm sorry. 0.5 percent. <laughs> All right. Move to the next slide. On our operating expenses, this does not include labor increases. Um, this does include step and longevity. So our personnel, if you look at our labor line is up 2.6% per for the year. But like I said, that is just our step increases in longevity. Uh, I'll mention the positions in a, in, in a minute. Then we had some overtime increase and of course medical that we're assuming 5.6 is going up. On the non-personnel costs, fuel is gonna be a big driver along with utilities. As you've seen, 9% increase in our electric, electric bills here. Um, in the county. And like I said, if we start getting electric buses, it's going to go up even more. And fuel, I mean, who knows what that's going to be? It's been taken off. It's slowed down. Hopefully it'll come back down. So if you move to the next slide, our, um, and, but here's where it's actually been good, but we're still looking into it. Our sales tax, as you know, has been doing very well this year. So we're actually increasing that to, uh, about $4.5 million or about 17% increase over year over year. So that's why it's way up. And our federal and state grants have increased to about another $3.9 million. So that's been good. And like I said, as part of our UAL, and we've gone out with this bond, 
year over year, it's about 900K savings, which is actually really good. Um, had we stayed with the UAL, it's more like another 1.6 million savings, but um, it's 900K year over year. And then on our transfers, uh, this is money that we take off our operating PL and we move it over to specific items, it's primarily capital. So we, we're moving an additional 200,000 for our bus replacement fund and another 3 million to cover ERP and our capital reserve replenishment. So capital reserve is, think of that as money that we need to do some of the smaller projects around here that uh, have to get done, broken air conditioners, broken stairs, whatever the case may be. So if we wanna to move to the next slide. So on our, personnel pieces, what we're going to do is we're looking to fund eight and defund two. So the first two above, mobility training coordinator is going to get funded and we're going to uh, defund the accessibility coordinator. Same thing with the next one, marketing assistant coordinator is going to be funded, customer service coordinated is going to be defunded. So think of those as a wash. We are going to ask for a new account three position. And then also an IT project coordinator, and that's provisional, so it's only for two years. Uh, so those are really the two additional pieces that we'll need to cover. Uh, there, we are asking for three bus drivers and one pair of cruise uh, van driver, and that's going to be funded by um, our Measure D revenues. So and the, the IT project coordinator is, has to do with our uh, move towards the um, ERP, the, the new ERP system, right? Yes, Thank and all the systems associated with it. So, the, so net six positions, uh, two are really ones that we're looking to, to actually have funded, whereas the other four are already gonna be covered under the major D revenues. Flip to the next slide. And then quickly on the capital budget, and like I said, this is very, very preliminary, and we're still having discussions today. So if we move to the next slide. So right now we're looking at a budget of about 16 million. We still have some timing issues and we still are, are vetting through, uh, which was a great discussion between what type of electric vehicles or whether we're start moving towards, you know, hydrogen because we're looking at possibly doing that as well as what are we gonna do infrastructure wise and specifically with the new CEO coming in, they may have a new vision that we may have to change this dramatically. Don't know and we won't know until May when we come back to the board. But at least right now we have satisfy this requirement for right now for the month of March. And that is, I mean, for the most for the most part, this is it. The rest of it is just kind of timing that we're going to be coming back um, and presenting. So that's all I have. Very good. Thank you, Chuck. Any okay. questions from the board? Mike? I was just going to move approval for claims purposes. We have a second. Second. Okay. I'll second. I'll second that, Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. All right, we had a motion from Rotkin, second from McPherson. Any discussion? People are ready to roll on. How about a? That's for the public, I think. Bruce. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mike. Any comments from the public? I don't see hands. Um, I am keeping it a moment, but I think not. Good. Donna, can we do a roll call? Okay. Uh, Director Downey. Aye. Director Dutra. Aye. Director Cullen Terry Johnson. Aye. Director Koenig. Aye. Director Lynn. Aye. Director McPherson. Aye. Director Myers. Aye. Director Pegler. Aye. Director Parker. Aye. Director Peterson. Aye. And Director Rockin. Aye. And the motion passes unanimously. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, that was great, Chuck. All right. Um, we are down to the end here. I want to announce our next meeting. It will be Friday, April 22nd at 9 a.m. And it will still be by teleconference. And with that, we adjourn our meeting at 12.06. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your time. And I hope Very you good. have a wonderful weekend. Good Thank you, everyone. Good Bye. Bye. Take care, Bye. everyone.